Welcome to the Finance Geeks Podcast with Paul Korth and Warren Chu. Expect a lot of laughs and genuine insights that might just transform the way you look at your finances. Remember to follow, like, and subscribe to the show. And now over to the geeks in the studio. But they are not in a studio. They are geeks in their own office. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Finance Geeks podcast. Thanks for joining us. My name is Warren Shute. I'm here joined by... Paul Clueth. Hey, Paul. And today, Paul and I are talking about raising money smart kids. So if you are a parent out there, an uncle or an aunt, or maybe just a friend, a godparent, um, hopefully we're going to share both our real life experience and some skills that we've picked up along the way on raising money smart kids. But before we dive into that, because I know we've got some great things to share. Paul, what have you been up to? What have I been doing? Right, I, this morning I did a weighted West... A weighted vest, weighted vest walk. So I wore my twenty kilogram vest. I look like some suicide bomber because that's what they look like. Right? <laughs> Warren nearly choked on his tea. Then anyway, I'm there wait, wearing my wraparound glasses, got my cap on, taking the dog for a walk. Did three and a half miles. And the reason I'm doing, I'm weighted. The reason I'm wearing my weighted vest. Yeah, the reason why I'm wearing it. Is because I'm still I'm in training for the third of August, which is the fan dance, the summer fan dance. There, I've done it before. We've talked about it on the podcast before, but it's a big, big task. You know, uh, physical effort to get up and over Penny Van in the Brecon Beacons, fifteen miles. So I don't think I'm going to do anything for charity again and ask people for more money. Everyone's got it hard enough at the moment, but uh, um, with taxes going up as much as they will do under our new government, who uh, by the time this goes out is probably uh, is probably uh, all in force. Uh, we're recording on the 4th of July. So happy Independence Day to all of our American listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also going to uh, go on holiday on Sunday. I'm taking my, my boy, Miles, who's 12, taking him to Italy. So we fly to Verona from Stansted, and we're going to stay near Lake Garda. And we're going to Frankio Carta karting track, which is quite a famous one. Outside carts that go 70, 80 miles an hour. Some of them 100 miles an hour. It's ludicrous. Anyway, we're going to the BRM factory where they make the chassis, and we're hopefully going to go to the Ferrari factory as well, um, cool. which is going to be really fun. Um, other than that, it's been sports days recently with kids, my, my boys, uh, you know, winning a medal. Uh, Mars won a high jump, and Rory got a medal for participating in the <laughs> round. Round the uh, they, it, when he's when they're only eight, they, they, oh, he's nine. He's not eight. He's nine. When they do a bit of everything, six or seven different things. You know, his house, I think, came second overall, so he's pleased. But I, they, I think they gave a particip- participation badge to pretty much everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> uh, for, an- for another time, another discussion. <laughs> Warren, what have you been up to? Uh, well, it was a big event for me last week, or week before actually last. Um, I was 50 this year, and part of my celebrations, I agreed with my two old school friends to do something special so we sort of sat down at school there were four of us um one of our friends kevin blessing passed away about three years ago so there's three of us left and we said you know what should we do to memor- make memories and uh, to remember our birthday so we decided to do the three peaks so rather than go off to spain or something like that and just get drunk and party we thought we'll hire a camper van we're together for five days we drove all the way up to ben nevis about 11 hour journey Stayed overnight there, did Ben Nevis, which um, I've done before, but i got to say it was harder this time than I did it last time. So it? I don't know whether that was age, the weather, or what, but it was. T- it just seemed forever coming down. What was the weather like? What was the weather like when you were there? Uh, there was snow at the top. There was snow at the top, put our waterproofs oh, yeah. on. About just uh, just under halfway up, we all got our waterproofs on and yeah. Um, yeah, just carried on going up. It was Going up wasn't so bad. Coming down for me was relentless. It just kept going. Well, on the on. knees? Um, tough on yeah. your legs or what? Tough on the knees, on the yeah. knees and the calves and the shins and your quads yeah. and you know can be just, hard coming down. Yeah, really hard, really hard. So that, especially that was when ben, you're fifty. Yeah, especially when you're fifty. Yeah, and you're as fit <laughs> as I am. So that was that was that was Ben Nevis, which was great fun. We then headed down to Scarfell, to Scarfell. Scarfell was a completely different experience. We had probably the best weather we could have hoped for, and um, Scarfell Pike. Yeah, Scarfell Pike. Yeah, because there is a mountain called Scarfell which is next to it. We went at Scarfer Bike. And um, that was beautiful, absolutely lovely. But we got put in our place when <laughs> we got overtaken by a couple of youngsters who ran up 
in about 59 minutes. That took us about what? two and a half hours. I know. They literally ran up in 59 minutes. Um, I thought you were going to say you got overtaken by two OAPs that were in their 80s with, uh, you know, <laughs> canes. They, they, beat no, no, us. No, they were young, athletic. <laughs> Bless them. They were good. And then the one of the most challenging, actually, was Snowden, which is ironic because I've done Snowden dozens of times. But the winds were horrendous. The winds must have been like 40 mile an hour winds. And uh, some lady ahead of us actually got blown over on the floor and smacked her head. So she was okay. Oh, she was God. with someone and they walked. Yeah, it's pretty serious. Um, and there was one point where we we're going to turn back because the winds were that heavy. And we didn't, thankfully. We did it. Um, we got up there, just touched the top, did our bit. And the shop was closed. I don't know whether this could do the wind. And then we headed back down again. Um, Brilliant. but uh, we had a fantastic it's a big achievement. It's a big achievement. Yeah. Three peaks, you know, yeah, you've it, got to be reasonably fit for sure to, to do all three peaks. And you did it in three days, didn't you? Rather than days, the, yeah. the 24 yeah. hours thing, which some people do, and you see you're driving the whole time, well, just driving, it, driving, driving. Yeah, because you know, I don't know where you start the journey from, but the journey from uh, there's got to be 10 plus hours of driving in, in doing that. Must it's be. a pretty, but for me, I don't do it for the challenge, I do it for the beauty. You get mm. up there and you look, and uh, albeit. Ben Nevis was cloudy, but normally it's so beautiful, so clear, and you can see so far. I've been up Ben Nevis before, and a Typhoon fighter jet has actually flown below me. I've looked down on it. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Having memories like that is pretty special. So yeah. I like I like it. I really enjoy it. And I got back, and I messaged my buddy who I went to visit in New Zealand when I was much younger, and I said, hey, what was that height of that mountain we went up in, in New Zealand, Mount Roy? And it was the same height as Ben Nevis. And I literally went up it in the morning after being at a club with him all night, having a skin fall. And we just woke up, said, let's go for a walk. And we went up this Mount Roy. So um, how on earth I managed that when I was younger. But um, yeah, they, yeah. It, it was fun. It was fun. Very good. But, what, what's uh, the height? Which one's the – so let me just think. Ben Nevis is the highest. Well, yeah, how ben high Nevis. is that? 1,300 mm. metres? Yeah, I do, I do it in feet, about 5,000 of feet, yeah. So, um, and then um, it is in elevation from where you start is actually Snowdon and then Scarfell. But yeah, from yeah. sea level, Scarfell's higher, but you start at a higher point with Snowdon. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, this, this is it. And, and you, the people don't realise, do they? When it, when it says it's 1,000 metres, you, you don't start from zero. You know, you, yeah. you're obviously higher up already, yeah. aren't you? So yeah. I, think, I think with the Penny Van, you, you, the incline is about 500 metres. So it's 886 metres, I think, to the top of Penny Van. So that's not as high as the ones you've been up. But uh, the aim from the starting point in 2.2 miles is to get up there in 45 minutes yeah. um, with the backpack. And once you get – and you elevate about 500 metres. But it's up um, and, and over, then, isn't it? Yeah, it's up and over. Of course it is. because it's up, And then over again. So you end up doing 1,000 metres overall um, yeah. in terms of actual uh, inclines. But uh, – yeah. yeah, very good. So that's that's good. So you so you feel fit as a fiddle at the moment, or are you now aching and recovering? No, no, no. I was, fine. I, look, I was aching literally for like two or three days afterwards, and uh, my knees actually ached for about a week, five days afterwards. But now I'm fine. Yeah, I'm all good now. So it's all all repaired. In Bella, my daughter just come back from doing a DV gold, um, and she spent three nights out, four days going up and out over Penny Fan and all, all those mountains. Yes. Like so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. she's feeling how I was feeling. She's only seventeen, <laughs> so maybe feel a bit better. Bit, bit better, yeah. so uh, that's good. Right, should we get on with our main topic today, our uh, focal point? What are we talking about today? So we're raising money for smart kids. So um, we're going to share our real-life experience and also some things that we teach people um, on raising money smart. So I think it's so important. I think one of my big, hairy, audacious goals, one of the things that's really important to me that I would like to do before I retire is to try and get personal finance taught to every 16 year old in school um i do quite a lot of work in schools going in teaching kids and stuff like that i'd really like to get it it is on the curriculum but mainstay taught to every child because i think if you have the key fundamentals that we're kind of going to go through today i expect um you're going to come out of life out of school with a much clearer objective of securing financial freedom whatever that might be for you what have, what have you got in store for us but where do you want to start well I was thinking about it, about what's the best way to, to teach kids. And I, I think you have to start with, with the basics, right? So when kids are younger, you start giving them some pocket money. And what we're trying to do really is to teach them the value of money. Um, yeah. And so I know that you've said in, in previous podcasts, you give them um, two, two pounds pa for every a, a year of their, of their age yeah. per month. <laughs> That's correct, yeah? That's right, yeah. So, right, yeah. so whatever, you, whatever one decides to give them. Um, my wife and I give our kids the same 20 pounds a month. Right. And, but it doesn't physically, it's not a cash handed over. We actually use uh, the Rooster Money app, but we use the virtual money tracker. And so what we're doing is because we, we're buying them, 
you know, the things that they want most of the time anyway. We don't live near any corner shops or anything like that. We're 15 minutes from pretty much everywhere. So um, we, we just do everything electronically. So our eldest son has got a, a card, a rooster money card, where he can uh, use that on the bus and things like that. And he can use it if he's in a, in a shop. But it's all electronic. It's always t- tap and touch, you know. So very rarely do they actually have cash. Let, let's, let's dive in on that. I think that's a really important point. So um, wh- I don't know about Rooster, so let's talk about Rooster in a second. But um, we did a similar sort of thing. So I guess if you're a listener, you're thinking, you know, do I give pocket money or not? That's the first question. Um, and then, you know, is there any conditions tied to it? And then how do I give it? And how frequently and how much? Um, so we kind of said that we would give pocket money. Uh, we had a, a bit of a mantra saying, you know, we'll buy their needs they'll buy their wants. You know, there's a bit of a simple way of describing it. So if they needed something, school uniform, school trip, that kind of thing. But if they wanted to buy something, they can go and do it. And yeah, we yeah. used the OSPA card. Um, and now that's only because I don't think Rooster was around at the time. And also probably because I'm not as diligent as you is doing the research. You've probably scoured them all and made sure you got the best one. But um, I intentionally wanted to use plastic because I wanted to teach my children how they will spend money in the future. I didn't want to hide away from it. It's a bit like alcohol. It's a bit of a taboo subject. But, you know, in our house, we wouldn't hide alcohol away from our children because our belief system, a personal belief system, is if we hide something, they might crave it more. So yeah, I want yeah. to do that. So tell me about the rooster card. How does that sort of work? What it sort of processes it? Well, the, there's different types of, of rooster card. You know, you um, I don't <laughs> I don't like the idea personally of paying for a monthly debit card for a, for a, for a child. Now, most of the time you can't have a bank account for a child uh, until they're 18. And so you can have certain type of accounts, savings accounts and so forth, but you, you know, you can't give a normal debit card and you certainly can't get a credit card until you're at least 18 and adult. So I thought, well, rather than pay a monthly subscription of the 199 or the 19 pound 99 a year for additional benefits, um, I thought what we do is we'll keep the tracker, use the app itself, the Rooster Money virtual money tracker for the kids. And they have one each. And when they get pocket money or birthday money, it sounds bad, but when they get cash in a card or something, we'll I'll go, I'll have that, put that in my bank, in my pocket. And then if it's £10, we'll credit their money so they can see what they've got. I definitely think that, that there is a, a method of, you could give children coins and have them put it in a piggy bank. Yeah. And I don't know if that's old school now, but if you, you know, will they value it? Because We've had a situation where our, our youngest boy, who's now nine, uh, Rory, you know, he'd find money around the house and go and put it in his piggy bank, a tandem piggy, piggy bank, of course, in his in his in his room. And then sometimes they they get it all out and they count it. And other times, you know, they he might lose some of the money. And and we had a situation at a fair a couple of months ago in in um, or about a month ago in in, in K- Kimpton, and we gave Miles a twenty pound note because we didn't have a five or a 10 and you had to pay everything cash there in a lot of places. Some would do the top, the, the, the tap and you could pay it on a card, but we gave him this 20 pound and he accidentally ripped it. So he threw it away and, <laughs> and it's 20 pounds. And I said, where's that money going? And he said, Oh, I ripped it. And some other adult that was watching him at the time just said, Oh, that's no good now. And I was, and I said to him, well, where is it? And I was looking in the bin <laughs> where he put it looking because I thought, well, you can sell a tape it up. It still would be legal yeah. currency after that. It's still valid. So the point is, it's it's harder for children to appreciate the money, if even if they've got it physically. But but what we've been trying to do is explain to our children what the cost is and what the value of money is. And you know, when they uh, when they then they've got money in their rooster account from Christmases, from birthdays, we'll show them what it is. And when they say, "Oh, can I use this money to buy a game?" we have a discussion. And I'm sure you've yeah. done something similar. But the, the figures are, are, are quite expensive expensive now so a, a child who wants a new game for their xbox that costs 50 pounds and they happen to have 100 pounds in their rooster money account i'm thinking i said to him do you really want to spend 50 pounds of your money on this one game yeah i do yeah i do and i was like well okay and sometimes we'll you know we'll do it for them but other times uh, if it's to do with they want robux or skins in a game or extra money that's 20 pounds of robux i'm thinking mm, we have limits on that i'll usually do 10 pounds max even if it's their money so, I tell, so you mentioned it before, I tell you what we did, not saying it's the right way, but it's just something that my wife and I did. So we did two pounds for each of their age. So when they were 10, they got 20 pounds. Uh, when they were eight, they got 16 pounds, that kind of thing. <laughs> and they had to work for that money. They had to do chores around the house. And when yeah. they didn't, we physically held the money back. Um, and they only have to act once or twice, and they realize that you're being serious from it. And then yeah. with regards to spending, what we did is we said, okay, look, if you spend, uh, if you want to spend anything up to your age, that's fine. Anything over your age, you've got to come in and check in. 
So if they wanted to go and buy, you know, a, a, my Ollie generally spent his money on games and stuff like that. So a 20, 30, 40 pound game or something, he'd have to come in and we would discuss just exactly what you did. And we'd say, yeah, if you research, got the best price, now go and think over 24 hours. If you still want it tomorrow, then you can get it. Um, yeah. Cause we, we, I think you, know, well, you have to empower them, don't you? You have yeah. to give them the option. Ultimately, if it's their money and they want to buy something. So if we're walking around a supermarket or walking in a toy shop and, and, and I say, uh, help him understand, you know, that's 50 pounds or that's 20 pounds. Are you sure you want that? Are you sure? And then just at least have him question it. And sometimes yeah. they put it back and sometimes they want it. And if they want it, when it's, when the money's gone, it's gone. The best, the best story I've got of that is when we first introduced it, I was in a supermarket with Bella, my daughter, and she must have been about seven or six or something like that. And she went over to get to the stationery aisle, girl, stationery aisle, picked up all the fancy pens and coloring stuff, brought them all back with her puppy dog eyes and said, hey, daddy, can I have these? I'm like, yeah, sure you can. How much is it? And she'd worked it out, she'd add it up. I said, that's great. So that comes out of your pocket money. Are you okay with that? And she's like, yeah. really? Oh, I've got to- <laughs> so she took them all back and brought one pencil back. Just one pencil. And yeah, I just think, yeah. you're right, these are lessons we're trying to... Now, we don't know if we've got it right, but hopefully we're trying to empower children to understand money a bit and also not be afraid of it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, But I, I'm a big believer personally in getting them to work for it. Uh, my children grow up in a much more privileged household than I did financially, and I want them to respect and appreciate money when they are adults. Um, because I think if you respect money, it will look after you. If you abuse money, then it will just run away from you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 this teaching anybody the value of something, I think, is hard. I mean, even adults, you know, the, to really understand, is that value for money? You know, and think about how hard you've had to work for that. You, you know, most of the clients we work with are working, you know, or they, they've had a working life. They, they've earned their money. And then you've got to, to spend something. And I think that there's a there's a direct correlation between those who have to work for their money and how much they value it and how much they research how much something costs and making that decision uh, uh, to, compared to other people that have just either received inherited that money received it from an inheritance or their parents or they've not had to actually work that hard for it and yeah. and their their relationship with money is very different and is. they don't appreciate yeah. how much it takes or, or you know whether that's good value oh I'll go and buy that uh, fifty thousand pound car because I can. Not that it's a good idea or that it makes any kind of financial sense. So um, it, 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 we, we're talking about it on a bigger scale there. But for kids, it's the same. You know, what does an iPhone cost? Yep. It's expensive. Yep. What does a pencil cost that you were saying or even a chocolate bar? One of the things we used to play, uh, and we still play, ironically, actually, just because it's habit as a family, is guess the bill. So we'd go out for a meal. We'd go out for a meal, and we would all race to grab the bill. And we'd like cover it up. And say, okay, guess the bill, and we'd all have to guess the price of the bill. And my outcome in playing that game is for the children to understand the cost of things. Does that make yeah. sense? Because otherwise, you just put the credit card a there. Bill from them. a meal. Yeah, typically, or yeah, typically yeah, yeah, a yeah. meal. Yeah, typically a meal. So the meal you've eaten at a table. Meal comes, and you put your hand over it. You make sure you know you can see it. Okay, play guess the bill. What's the price of that meal? And it's great for. And, and even now, we still play it just because it's a bit of fun. And we've been playing it since they were like six years old or something. Um, of yeah. just having an idea. Because for me, my outcome is for them to understand value for money. And that's what it is. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And I, 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 I would recommend, Paul, and any listener to do this too. Um, I took them on my own to a trip to McDonald's. And we got our meal, what we wanted to. And we took them upstairs. We sat down. And I explained to them that there are three types of person in McDonald's. There, are, Carry there, on. Are, the, there are the consumer, the person yeah. who pays money to buy this. Okay, So it's cost us money to come here. There are the employees who work here. And they work and they earn money. And then there's the investors, the people who buy the stock, who buy the company. And you get your laptop open. I got my iPad open at the time and I brought up the stock at McDonald's and you showed them to them. I said, look, you know, if you'd have taken your money from this meal and bought um, uh, McDonald's stock and just hold on to it and then just give them the experience of saying, you know, ownership of a business is the way that you create money over time so yeah. that you don't have to be the worker in the store. Um, and on the back of that, since they are about eight, now I'm not saying this is a good investment decision. We bought our children a share every year of their life. I'm talking about they were 17. I think we bought Bella one this year, but that was it. Um, and you know their choice, whatever they wanted to buy. So they were engaged in their investment process. We physically bought shares. You don't have to, if you're listening and you don't have the ability because of you don't have an account, you don't have the money. The London Stock Exchange, I understand, has a virtual trading account as well. So you have to buy the visit, but 
you know, Ollie was very much into Apple from a young age. So he bought Apple, Netflix, and uh, Microsoft, um, Nike, I think he bought. And I think um, Bella was very much into Disney, Netflix, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But they they had skin in the game. They understood it. And it was for their birthday. For their birthday, we'd sit down and we'd buy one share. Yeah. Um, so uh, just trying so, to get So you could do that birthday. virtually, or you could buy it inside a junior ISA because, of course, they can't access yeah. that till they're age 18. So grandparents yeah. or your mum and dad parents – put their money in the kids could even contribute their own pocket money if if, if it's uh, you know 20 pound a month they could do that uh, and they could buy direct shares collectives unit trusts or, or, or hold the money in cash I, I really like the idea of that because it's it's giving the it's teaching them responsibility it's teaching them a bit more about how money works in the world the fact that you can mm-hmm. save it you can spend it you can invest the money um, and in the same method of taking them to a, a restaurant like McDonald's you know you could take them to the bank. And you could take them with you to the bank and open up a savings account with them to explain that um, this is how money is held. You know, it's it's held virtually, um, but it's, uh, you know, there are savings accounts, current accounts and so forth. If you're listening as a, you think, oh my God, you guys do so much more than I'd ever do. Um, we're not, I'm not perfect. You know, my son the other day said, hey dad, you know, I don't really understand credit score and I don't really understand about credit cards and stuff. And I was like, wow, I thought I would have imparted that over the years and taught you about this, and I didn't. Um, he goes, yeah. I, I need to know about it. I'm like, yeah, sure do. You do need to do it. So, you know, I'm not sat here thinking I've got it all sorted out and I've done it all and it's all perfect. I'm just sharing some of the things that I've done because they're important to me and like natural to me, I guess. Um, but as a listener, you know, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. I think you probably say just conversations around it, right? It's it it is. It, I mean, it's the same with learning anything. You can't just talk to somebody, whether it's a child or an adult once and expect them to just understand it. And then, and then that's it once it takes a number of times. I mean, it's something like nine or 12 times to show somebody something before they fully understand it. So the more that you can bring it up and talk about it, perhaps in a different method um, about the value of something, about how interest works on cash, about how a bank works, about how a credit card works, and we can get to those yeah. things in a minute. But the more that you do, the more they'll get it. And, and we're talking here about raising money smart kids. So we're talking about those that are less than 18. I think that it's appropriate to probably start even when the child's you know six, seven or eight years old and, and start to at least talk to them about what things cost. Uh, you're not going to talk to them about compound interest at age six unless they're very, very smart indeed. Um, but it's it's about building that knowledge over time because I think we can probably agree that this is not something that's sort of on a curriculum at school. Certain schools, I understand it, when they get to 16 and they're in sixth form, there are classes where they can they, are, they do talk a bit about finance and they get people in like yourself. And I volunteered at the Parents Association at, at a Hitchin Boys School recently, went to see the head, went to see a group of 20-odd people there and said, look, I'm happy to come in pro bono to talk to the kids about finance. And they said, great, let's do it. And I said, because, you know, they are, the kids are uh, are the future. They need to understand this to get the right money habits before they go into the wide world. Mm. Because you think, well, what's a good income? You know, how do you buy a house? Um, What do I do with the cash? You know, which, what what does the, uh, you know, what is holding it in a bank account? What does that mean? And how do credit cards work? I mean, I know adults that don't understand these things. Why would they, some people know how to earn money, but they don't know how money works. Yeah. Um, no, I agree so, with that. So, so I'm going to ask you a question, Warren, in your, <laughs> in your skills as a very qualified advisor, right? This is it. I'm putting you on the spot here. It's okay. What, there's, there's four answers to this, yep. and there's a riddle as well. What is the function of money? So you can give me any of the four answers. What's the function of money? So as a means to transfer wealth. Okay. So I would yeah. probably describe. So I, I I have a bunch of I have some food which makes me wealthy. You're hungry. You don't have anything other than money. You can transfer that money to me, and I can transfer the. Um, it's a it's a means so, of exchanging wealth. It's it's a medium of exchange. So that's one yeah. definition, one function of money. Do you know the other three? Do you know what? I I could probably think of them if I had enough time. It's going to be really go- mind goes blank. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so so. Uh, I remember doing this presentation to Verulam School in St. Albans, and I and I thought I was putting together a presentation on money, and I thought, well, I've got to at least start with explaining what money is and what the function of money is. And there's a little riddle that goes like this. Money is a matter of function for a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. So the first one is a medium, a medium of exchange. So rather than barter for goods, we pay for them. So that's what yeah. money serves as. Number two 
is a unit of account, right? So it's a unit of measurement uh, of the market value of goods. So you price something in, in monetary terms, whether it's a share or some food on the shelf at a, a restaurant or a hotel, at a um, supermarket. The, the third one is a store, a store of value. So money must be able to be reliably saved, stored or retrieved because inflation erodes the value, right? So it's a store of value. And then lastly, it's a standard of deferred payment. So what that means, it's an accepted way of settling a debt. And, and, and I won't be able to remember that little riddle. Money is a, a, money is a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. Okay. Yeah, nice. I like it. I like it. It's Because like, we don't really know what money is, do we? So it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's, it's sort of we use it. And I think that very few people these days probably hold a lot of cash. You know, it's, 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 oh, it's, a, it's a thing me. of the past where you don't generally hold a lot of cash in your wallet. Now, yeah. I would recommend to people to have some cash in their wallet at any time, whether it's 20 quid or 50 quid or whatever. But you don't hold a thousand pounds in cash in your wallet unless you're going on a, a night out to certain places that you shouldn't. Um, and, uh, <laughs> what places would they be for? <laughs> don't know. A place of disrepute. What costs a thousand pounds? That's a good, good, good night out. But listen, if... if if some some places only accept cash, now if you go to a festival um, and there are food vans about, these days they're getting wise to it. They don't just all receive it in cash. You can just touch and you can tap and they can do it a lot of very quickly and easily. Um, and I think it's dependent on what your preference is. But the point is that most now people get paid directly into their bank account. They can see what it is on an app. They pay for something by touching and tapping and now it's a hundred pounds, isn't it? That you can touch and tap. And, um, you know, you... you um, but the rest think- of it, you either pay on credit, or you pay on a MasterCard or a Visa, or you pay on an Amex. That's what you do, but credit or debit. Don't you think, and we're going off topic here a little bit, but don't you think the emotion has been taken away from spending? And I think that's why people get in trouble. I, I think that it's problematic that, that those that perhaps don't have a great relationship with money have got the ability to use a card yeah. to, to buy something because it's different to handing over £100. You you do the example do, of take £100 in 520s, go to a store and pay for something in cash. And the, it's much more difficult mentally and emotionally to give that £100 across than it is just yeah. a tap. I agree. You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, and it helps you realise and understand the value of something more by using a bit of cash. So it's not a bad, a bad call to do that. So to link it back into emotion, because I think I'm quite keen on that with my clients, what I try and encourage my clients to do. So when Ollie and Bella were 13, so actually Ollie, Bella was 13, Ollie was 15, we opened them up a, a bank account. So at 13, you can have a child's bank account. Um, yeah. And we got the money through. So we got them away from the uh, OSPA card, which I think we were probably paying for, and they started using that. And um, they still had their pocket money. But what we actually did on top of that is we got them to have their um, – phones paid from from their accounts so we got them started paying for their own things so you get yeah. them to pay for their own pay for their own bill so um when my clients come in they say they pay their child's gym membership their child's mobile phone i'm like okay well look, can i give you an idea why don't you set an account up for your child in their name pay them an allowance which covers this but get them to pay for their gym membership and get them to pay for the mobile phone you're getting them used to paying for things and understanding yeah. the cost of money. And likewise, as soon as they start earning, we recommend the client start charging them a rent. So yeah. your, your children oh, are yeah, your children are paying a rent for living at home. Now, whether you return that money to them when they move out as a house deposit or something, that's a family affair. But yeah. the outcome really is you're trying to get your children to have a physical, emotional attachment to earning money, not just receiving yeah. it, and spending money. Um, so you've got some kind of transaction going on there. So that's yeah, probably uh, we share with our clients. I, I personally think that over the last 10, 20 years, and, and since the onset largely of the internet and social media, that that uh, a lot of children today, perhaps some of them think they're either going to be a YouTuber or they're going to be a sports star and they're going to earn, you know, £20,000 a week or £100,000 a week. Or be, and, and the thing is, it's it, it's it's not for me to say that they can't do it, but at the same time, you know, do – bit of reality check that that, that that the an average income in the country is about thirty five thousand pounds per annum and then you got to ask yourself well, what does that buy and so when children are older or young adults you start talking a bit more about uh, uh what reality is and how much things cost and how hard it is to earn this sort of money but but in, we're talking about raising money smart kids so you t- we talked about pocket money and and uh, uh having them understand the value of money and their relationship with money by doing things like getting them to do chores and having, mm-hmm. and I suggest we tried this in our house where we had a star chart. So if you do a good job, you get a star, you know, yeah. or when they get a house point at school, 
and sometimes Miles gets four house points in a day, you could put four pounds in their account. You say, that's great. You know that it's unlikely yeah. that they're going to get a hundred house points in a day and you're going to be out of money. So you could, <laughs> it's got to be realistic. But, but you know, there are, there are a lot of very, very wealthy clients that I work with where I think to, the, to myself, and I ask myself this question, are my children spoiled? Probably a bit. Are they entitled, which is, I don't like that word because I'd much prefer the term privileged. They are definitely privileged. If someone's quite well off and you, and you want to buy things for your children, whether it's a 500 pound Xbox or a thousand pound iPhone, which is ludicrous to give a 12 year old. But the point is, is that if you want to give them a 80 quid second hand phone from eBay, which is what we do, an iPhone SE, um, I still want them to understand that that's expensive. They've got to look after it yeah. and that it's their responsibility. And to try and build that responsibility over time by making sure they don't break things because things yeah. cost money. Everything costs money. I, I feel for my kids sometimes because I think I'm um, overly hard on them financially because I know what is available to them and how they their lifestyle is compared to what mine was growing up. So, um, yeah, I'm completely with you if you can buy something pre-owned. In, now Ollie's sort of earning a bit of money, doing things else. He'll, he's buying things and he'll he's smart, he's savvy. He's like, you know, I'm going to buy this, this refurbished one. You know, he bought a new, himself a new iPhone watch, um, the sports one. He goes, I'm going to get this 120 20 quid cheap. It's refurbished. It's absolutely fine. And I kind of thought, oh, do you know what, some, some of those lessons over the years have actually repaid and they've done, the, done their job. So, yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, so it's a good decision. You you, you so, put me on the spot earlier. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. Oh shoot. So when I'm presenting, particularly to, typically to children, but I also include to my adult presentations, I ask this question: If you were to save your child benefit, okay, so I actually say, look, to make it easy, let's say a hundred pounds a month. If you were to save a hundred pounds a month from your child's birth until they're eighteen, into a pension but you leave it there at age 18. You don't add to it anymore. You just leave it there and they access it when they're 68 years old. You'd have invested about 21 and a half thousand pounds, 21,600 pounds. How much do you think they would have at age 68? Six and a half million. Yeah, not bad. Pretty close. Four and a half. Do so you know why I know that it's in the millions? Why? Two reasons. Number one, because it's a long period of time. It's compounding and sort of, you know, I do this all the time. But secondly... You mentioned it on a previous episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I thought yeah. it's definitely some amount of millions. It's definitely, uh, you know. From a parent or a grandparent, if you're listening to this, you think about the money you're giving your grandchild over time and stuff like that, do this, any other. If you put it into a pension for them and they access this at a later age and you talk to them about what you're doing and why you're doing it, you're raising money smart kids. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a big effect, big effect. You can you can save a, a huge amount of money that way, and so we I think we've we've mentioned about saving into pensions into ISAs, and right. what, what you're really getting at there is the benefit of long term saving or investing long term the compounding effect long term, and it's definitely something that any parent that's receiving that money could 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 do to to save for their child, and I suppose getting the child involved in it, helping them to understand some of those numbers, and and, and uh, you know, you, you can't. I think it's a bit unfair to say to the child every time we give you pocket money, you have to save it, you have to invest it. <laughs> I mean, they've got to spend some on themselves. Sure. But um, sure. yeah, yeah. No, I, I like all of that. Um, yeah. Do you talk? Do you talk to your the kids at school about how you earn money? Because if you're educating children about about money in itself, not you don't have to just talk about saving and investing and pensions and all that stuff, which is a lot of which is difficult and boring. Do you talk to them about how you earn money? Um, not necessarily how you earn money, but I talked about what happens when you do earn money in respect of you get paid and how the pay system works and the deductions taken in tax and national yeah. insurance and things like that. But I don't talk to them about, you know, what jobs are available. I did a talk to some um, eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds, which is the youngest group I've ever spoken to, and that was principally about – and it, it touched on a lot of the areas. You know, what would you like to do for a living? How would you earn money? And you're right. They all wanted to be YouTubers and sports stars. And a couple wanted to be farmers, actually, which is interesting. This was in the, a deprived school in the middle of London. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if they've even been to a farm. But, but um, I, I, I also know that you're when you do presentations, tell me if I'm wrong here, that you spend as much of the discussion – educating children about money and investing and some of the things you can do as well as 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 you do talk to them about trying to inspire them to be yeah. all they can be yeah and that's so a big what, isn't that a big part of it to just think a, big a, a significant part yeah to get them to really believe in themselves and understand the understand about the concept of time and the decisions yeah. they make today consistently over time will direct their future so if they have a real bad day they do something wrong or they make a wrong decision that's not really going to affect their future 
unless they consistently go down that path. So yeah, uh, if I do normally it's like a forty-five minute presentation, fifty minute presentation, then like 10, 15 minutes Q and A, um, a good twenty minutes of that will be on what I refer to as the psychology of money. Definitely. I mention it every single time on the podcast, pretty much, and you pick me up on it. But you know, what's their outcome? What do they want to achieve? Where are they heading? Because it's those little I- incremental decisions, steps they take that's going to take them in that in that direction. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about building their confidence and their beliefs. And I think there's a fine line between having someone believe that they can be successful insofar, financially successful, not just successful in the other definition of the term of being happy and achieving your potential and you, your personal goals, but but just to um, be financially successful by thinking, right, well, I don't need to compare myself to what my parents do, what my friends do. If I want to become an accountant, a brain surgeon, you know, a, work at Ferrari. I mean, whatever it ends up they want to do, they can. They should be able to do it. You at least have the belief that you can do it. I think yeah. that's better to, to say that than it is, uh, and that they, you know, could earn more than just working in a, you know, at the corner shop. I mean, no disrespect to anybody who has a, a, a menial job or works in a factory. If, if you want to do that and, and, and you earn whatever you earn, you've just got to live within your means, haven't you? But the, you, if you wanted to earn more money, you've either got to get a job that pays more money or get an, uh, improve your education so that you can get into that position, or you sell a product, or you offer a service, or you have capital appreciation of your money, or you trade a product. And those five ways of earning money or making money is what I talk to, to kids about in a presentation. You know, it's not yeah. just about a job. You know, you can actually sell a product, sell a service, and you can invest money. And this is how you you make, how you grow your wealth. I constantly talk to my children about education. So not necessarily academic learning in a school, but just learning about things, exposing yourself to the opportunity of success. You know, when we're, Ollie's very much into becoming like a chartered surveyor. So we talk about buildings and property and rental yields and, you know, how things work in development. And, you know, what happens if you bought a house and you renovated it? What would that look like? And things like that. Because I think then other opportunities spark on the back of that. But it's these conversations as a parent or a guardian that you can have with your children about, you know, what, what is it you'd like to do? You know, if they say, I want to be a hairdresser. So how does that look? You know, what happens if you owned a hairdressing salon? Wonder yeah. if that would be a good idea because you could help other people become hairdressers and just put a spin on it to see if they want to achieve more. Now, not everyone wants to achieve more. And I'm actually not one of those people who say saying being employed is wrong. I think for some really smart people, they actually work for somebody, they earn a good living, they pocket well, and when they close the door from the office, they've got no thoughts whatsoever. You know, we yeah. were talking off air just now about going on holiday and trips and stuff. We work when we're away. We have things going on. 99% of employees don't. You know, they can just switch off and leave their job where they are. So so other things that you can do um, to educate your children, to raise money smart kids. Um, we talked to them a bit about the resp- introducing the responsibility of spending. And obviously, you want to set a good example to your child. And I, I think you've got to be a bit careful about the numbers that you present. So my children have asked me, you know, what does our house cost? And what does this car? And you're going to buy that that car, dad. And, you know, you, you don't want to start throwing around numbers and they them, them sort of taking them out of uh out of context, but um, I think important to create a bit of a, of a of a budget for the child, you know, and saying and and tracking some of the spending, whether it's using the Go Henry card or there's the the I'll put these in the show notes as well, or the Nimble card, which is a new one I've come across, n i m b l dot com, or Go Henry. So there's there's lots of them, but those are three, uh, uh, including the Roost the Money app, and then um, as well as creating the budget for the for the for the kids and talking to them about you know. Uh, uh, cash money in the hand versus a banking monies, uh, as in a you know a banking app. You've then got to help the the child understand the concept of credit, you know. And I think that that it's not discussed enough. Like how do you buy a house with a mortgage? What what's a credit card? What does that mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's fascinating that the kids in maths will talk about compound interest, and I think that if the teacher was they was really on the ball. They would they would bring in the discussion about well, let's talk about a live example of you of you borrowing money on a credit card and what twenty seven point nine percent APR means. You yeah, because yeah. not everyone knows what this means. You know, no, it doesn't. Um, no, you're right. I think that's a really good point. It's a really good point. You know, it's like bringing that idea of debt into the equation. You know, I've got to be honest. In my raising my children, I focus most of the, most of the time on investing and mm. growing wealth and arguably i probably should have spent an equal or some time at least on debt and things like that so i haven't really spoken to them about mortgages i don't think i've really spoken to them about credit cards and things so that's something i could probably even do as well 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's part of the discussion. You get to eighteen, you know, you open up a bank account. It's a big thing. That you, you, before that, you can open up one for sure. But when you, I remember going to university and open up an account with HSBC on the campus at Hull University, and uh, um, you know, you you would have your monies paid into it from if you get a grant or you get a student loan or you've earned some money or whatever. And uh, the the thing that I would encourage all parents to do, and what I'm uh, not being, you know, not being the oracle of all parenting, but certainly my own experience is just the the benefit of and, and the importance of hard work you know and and i and trying to get the child to understand the importance of working hard to earn money so so i'm going to give you an example of what i did when i was in my teenage years and before that to earn some money keep, keep and, I, and i'm interested to know what you PG. did <laughs> you what keep it pg <laughs> i will keep it PG. <laughs> very good very good so 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 pre-18 i would wash the cars of my neighbors Mow, yeah. the, mow the lawns, but washing cars was an easy way. And then babysitting as well. I did quite a bit of babysitting at 15, 16 onwards um, and earning five quid or 10 quid. And I thought it was all the money in the world. Yeah. But, but when I, when I was uh, uh, 18, I remember going work. Sorry, 17, I worked for McDonald's. Yeah. So I remember working for them for about six months. Exactly. Uh, that was hard work. And then at 18, I worked, I worked uh, over a, a three-week period at British Gas. And it was 12-hour days yeah. to get up at six in the morning so, or something like that start it was like five in the morning I had to get there for six six till six so 12 hours and then cycle back and it was it was on those you know the pump trucks where it was a big electrical outlet and it was all washing machines and dryers it was it was part of the factory um, and i earned 300 pound a week which i thought was just <sighs> millions but i had to work like 70 or 80 hours or something so you know, you're talking four pound an hour or something it was terrible pay um and worked in wing canton as well which was a, a for six months which is the night shift, which is a fridge. You're in a fridge, it's like three three degrees. And you, you again, you're putting foods, yogurts and cheeses in trolleys for, for that go out to the, on the big trucks that go out to the supermarket. No, I think it's good. I think, you know, working as a child and stuff like that is um, very important. It helps you communicate with adults, helps you earn, gives you sort of self-appreciation. I started working, I think as young as about eight. I worked on market stands. I worked in petrol Up stations. The it, no, no, I worked on a market. I used to serve people. I set the markets all up in the morning. I used to cycle to the market, set it up. I've worked in, um, yeah, a whole whole bunch of things. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily boy. Waiting was one of my favorite things. I used to enjoy waiting tables and things like that. I used to like that kind oh, of yeah. thing. But, Working behind um, a bar. But what what else can your kids do? Because mine are 12 and 9. So Miles mowed the front lawn the other day. I mean, yeah. did a, he, did a, he did his best and did a pretty good job. And I... I didn't sort of say, well, that job is now two pounds and that job's three pounds and all the rest of it. We used to try that and say, this job's tidy in your room is 20p or 10p or something. And, you know, putting all your clothes away in the washing, in the washing basket, there's 10p there. And it just got to the point where I was thinking, God, this is a lot of hard work, this. I'd rather yeah. have them set the table, do some chores, do some washing up, do some work to understand yeah. that everyone has to contribute. Yes. And then at the weekends, you know, and then say, okay, you've earned your pocket money without being very too overly specific about you have to do this. It's going to take 30 minutes or an hour. Yeah. Um, we we yeah. kind of lay Sanders down and say that, you know, you live in the house, therefore you've got to contribute. So making your bedroom and stuff like that is just a given. But actually, you know what, you can help us out by putting the um, the, the garbage out and the recycling out and uh, emptying the dishwasher and things like yeah, that. It's a team effort. It's absolutely yeah. a team effort. And, and but, uh, you know, realizing the importance of hard work. Can't stress it enough that, that just because the child goes to school and doesn't, doesn't mean, for me anyway, that when they come home, they can just do nothing and play computer games. I mean, listen, it happens, doesn't it? it they have everything until they yeah. get to a certain point, boys especially, yeah, they get yeah, to a yeah. certain point, they just expect everything to be done for them. And the fairies come and make their tea and, you know, uh, yeah. clean their rooms. And you're thinking, wow, you've, done, you've, you've worked, been to school for six hours. Woof, you must be shattered. But I also think as the children grow up, um, you know, and they potentially move out, getting them to understand about money and things in that way. So having the conversation with your partner about, you know, what's the plan here? We're buying a house together or we're renting together. Yeah. Are we going to split all the bills equally? Are we going to have an account for the bills where we put the money in? So yeah. taking that lesson from being young through to almost like when they're moving out and you know, if they decide to buy a place together, yeah. what's the exit plan? Okay, so we're hoping we're going to stay together forever, but if we don't, yeah. if one of us leave how are we going to sell it what, what's the deal on selling this property so yeah. having some kind of so teaching them and helping them along the way because i think until you've really had experience with money and experiences in life it's quite hard to make decisions around them so you can't just expect your children when they move out to understand things but just get them to start thinking things through a little bit yeah 
Yeah, go, going back to that, that uh, uh, what came to mind then is the the concept of instant gratification and sort of buying things now and enjoying your money now and buying that pair of hundred pound trainers or that piece of clothing or whatever or going on that holiday and having no money left. And and the the concept of either deferred gratification of saving it, investing it, and getting that balance right, and and a lesson that I think that all parents can employ themselves as well as teach their children is it it, it is all about you know uh, uh, understanding the budget, the money coming in, the money going out, what things cost, the value of money, and making sure that you don't just just live for today. I mean, kids, that's the thing what they go through. They go through a period of, Daddy, I want this. Can I have it? If you yeah. just give them everything and they just have it, they don't understand that there's restraints, that, that when they go out in the big wide world, that they will have someone that says no. So you've yeah. got to say no to your children. You've got to make sure that they don't just get everything and have everything, is even if you're in a position to give it to them. Um, yeah. And that level of restraint, I think, serves them well in the future, um, you know, enormously. So yeah. um, no, I agree. You know, m- money doesn't grow on trees. I've used that expression at my house. I'm sure you must have done. <laughs> <laughs> as much so as I love, I'd love to have a money tree. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I think we've kind of covered from you know when they're small children, grandparents, and stuff like that. But do you want me to summarise or anything else you want to add in? No, I think I think that that's covered most of it for me. I, I think I'd like to uh, also. You, you were talking about older kids; they're going to buy a house together or whatever. You know, usually young young adults, but. Um, prior to going to higher education, I think it's important to to educate children on how a bank account works, credits, debits, standing orders, um, how a debit card and a credit card works, and, and how student loans work as well if they're going to go to university to make sure they don't saddle themselves with too much debt. Okay. So I think, you know, I think it's a fair uh, summary to say that um, talking about money is ideal. Um, and making sure you talk about things that you're familiar with. So not only about investing that I did, but also about debts and mortgage and such like as well. And trying to get your children to understand the value of money so that you're talking about day to day cost of things, whether it's a meal or cars or houses, what you might be buying. Um, so they understand things that you're doing there. Um, and they getting- appreciate them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Getting your children to invest at a young age might be a good idea as well. And using some of the apps and the banking systems that um, Paul's mentioned about Rooster and Go Henry and the other ones, Nimble, I think would be a good idea to help them to spend money on plastic because that's what they're going to be doing when they're older. Don't sort of just cover the subject and don't talk about it. Raise it at the table and have raising money smart kids on the forefront of your mind. So, Paul, do you have any uh, quotes for us today? I've got, I got a couple of tips um, and I've got a couple of quotes, right? So uh, the, the one tip, in fact, there's, I'm going to put this in the show notes for anyone to have a look at it. But there was, there was an episode from one of my favorite uh, authors and podcasters besides Warren, uh, Morgan Housel. He, he did an episode called The Best Financial Advice I Know, What I Want My Kids to Learn. And, it, and it's only about 10 or 15 minutes, but it's, it's, I'm going to put the link in there to, to, to Spotify where you can download the podcast. It's actually really, really interesting because he doesn't just talk about how to educate kids about money when they're young. He talks about what, what he would want them to know in the younger part, the, you know, the beginning part of their life, whether it's all the way up to 20s or 30s. But all the things that, looking back, he, he thinks who you should know. So, you know, what you want them the best financial advice. So it's a combination of factors, but it's really good. So, okay. so that's a, a link that I want people to have a look at. And then I've got two, two or three small quotes, right? One's a Japanese proverb, uh, money grows on the tree of persistence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I like that. I like that one. I, like I that thought one. that was a great little short one from a uh, Japanese proverb. And then I got, uh, I like this one from, from two very famous uh, investors and businessmen. One's Warren Buffett. And he said, rule number one is never lose money. Rule number two is never forget rule number one, <laughs> which I always like that. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, because we're talking about kids and money and stuff, it's, it's actually from Bill Gates or it's attributed to him that I found. And it says, apparently he said, I definitely think leaving kids massive amounts of money is not a favor to them. No, I agree with that. Yeah, no, I agree. He's pretty that. well off. He's pretty well off. He's and I think doing that, him and Warren Buffett, I think, and other people that are billionaires have attributed to giving ninety nine percent of their wealth away to their to, to charities and so forth. And even one percent of their wealth is enormous, anyway. So this wasn't a quote I was going to say, but it's come to mind when you said that. And it's um, give them give them enough so they can do anything, but not enough so they can do nothing. And I, I often say that to my clients. So just give them enough so they can do anything they want like that, but not enough that they don't do anything. So uh, oh, I like that. 
Who, yeah. Whose quote was that? Is that another Warren Warren Shute quote? I think it might be a Warren Shute quote. Oh, Google wow, it. Wow, it says, I've been saying it for so many <laughs> it years. Would say it, Warren Shute. It is. I think it. Google it. It will say Warren <laughs> Shute said this. Okay. And uh, so thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, please like, share, and subscribe to our show. And please leave any comments or questions that you have, and we'll take a look at them in a future episode. Before I wrap up, this is going to be the last show for the current series. We're going to now break for the summer, uh, where we're going to take July and August off, and we'll come back to you with great ideas in September. During that time, if you get any questions, please make sure you send us a message on social media, and we'll make sure we respond to you. Until the next one, bye from me. It's bye from me. Thanks very much, guys. Enjoy your summer, and I'll see. we'll see you all, or I'll certainly hear from you all, in September. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion. If you have questions or comments about this podcast or topics you'd like to suggest for the show, please put these in the comments section on YouTube. Remember, if you find yourself humming our theme song for the next week, it's not a sign of brainwashing, it's just a testament to our awesomeness, or possibly a mild earworm. This show is designed to be informational only and does not constitute investment or financial advice. Please contact a regulated financial advisor before taking any specific action.